So this, we are taking a look at a few passages in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 over a few weeks, looking at our unstoppable God, and this morning, his unstoppable message in us. So that that's where we're headed. And let me just mention a couple of things. My name is Ben Unseth, and you, you and I may not have met yet. I'm the, the brand new pastor here at Faith, and I'm thrilled to be here and here in the room with a lot of people and online with some marvelous folks. So this morning, we are taking a look at God's unstoppable message, the gospel. And the gospel is this odd word. It's this very old English word, God spell or good word or good news. So that would spell like spelling a word. It's, so gospel, it just means good news. As when you look online and you look at the headlines, what tends to dominate the headlines? Is it all the happy things that happened today? If you turn on the, the TV news, what, what do you, what's going to show? Everything that's going wrong. We, we need some good news. And God says his good news is incredible. This is what, it's what we want to take a look at together today. And when we think about this good news, we, we want to make it plain. So last Friday, I went up, no, last Sunday night, I went up to Okaboji Lutheran Bible Camp with a bunch of our great students, and we, it was dark outside, and we were playing this hide-and-seek game and throwing bundles of socks at each other and chasing around and hoping we didn't trip over something in the dark. And we did a number of rounds of this, and one round, well, before each round, they would interview the the henchmen, the people who were supposed to catch us. And one of them said, they were, they were asked, you know, what is your strategy? And one of them said, well, I'm going to get Ben on Seth. <laughs> so being the brave man that I am, I sneaked out early and went and hid so they wouldn't be able to find me. And in, in the middle of all that, I, I called into the, the main cabin because nobody was coming in my area. So I, I called into the main cabin and said, well, if, if she wants to find me, you know, tell her I'm not moving. I'm not moving. But the, the, the news didn't get through clearly. So when I came back inside, there were people really concerned about me saying, are you okay? <laughs> are you hurt? Did, 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 you, did you break something? That's... Sometimes we don't get the news through clearly. And this is an amazing couple that had fabulous news. This is a couple named David and Svea Flood. A young Swedish couple. She was a, a famous singer in the country. And they went off to the Congo in the middle of Africa. If, if you look at a map of Africa where it shows like rainfall and everything, you know, the Sahara, the top half is all just kind of brown, and then most of it is kind of green, but the dark green part where they have the gorillas and everything, that's where they went, right, right in the middle, in what was called the Belgian Congo, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo, Kinshasa, I think it's called. And we need to tell the good news simply. Paul says, therefore, since we, through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Paul struggled sometimes. He said earlier, I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. But he, he said, I'm not going to distort the word of God. I'm going to set it forth plainly. In World War II, the Army Air Corps, that was our Air Force back then, they had a goal to fly high during the daylight and hit precise targets and just take out choke points in the, the Hitler's military supply chains just to break the whole army so that they couldn't do anything. That was the U.S. strategy. The British strategy was very different. The British strategy was to do what they called area bombing. They flew at night 
sending out thousands of planes at a time and just dropping them everywhere. They actually had a stated goal that they wanted to, to destroy the housing of half the workers in 18 months. What happens when you destroy housing? You destroy the people in the house. The, the, the strategy was involved killing civilians. But do you know what they called it? They called it de-housing. That, that's not really, that's distorting the truth, wasn't it? They, they, they wanted to kill so many people that it would destroy the morale of, of Hitler and his, his leaders. And we want to speak plainly about the word of God. We don't want to distort it. We want to make it plain. So that woman in the, the picture, her name is Savea Flood. She and her husband David, they went down to the Congo, and with another couple, they carved a path into the jungle with their machetes back in 1921. They carried their two-year-old two son on their backs. Both couples caught malaria. They went to one village, and they said, no, you can't live with us. Our gods will be offended. And then they tried to go to another village, and that village rejected them. So they just built a couple of homes out in a, a kind of a little meadow on, on a mountainside. Their only contact with the villagers was a young boy. The villagers wouldn't talk to them. The, they would send a young boy to sell them eggs. He would sell them chick, chickens and eggs. He could come twice a week. So Svea couldn't talk to anybody else, so she would talk to this little boy. He'd, he'd come to their house, and he would sell them chickens and eggs, and she would tell him about Jesus. And she told it plainly, because you're not going to tell it really complicated to to a kid who's speaking a different language from what you're used to speaking. And they prayed together. God's good news is light. I've always wondered what it would be like being in the jungle and trying to look up and see the sky because there's just so much overgrowth. And I've been in woods where you look up and you, you can't really see the sky sometimes. It's just all broken up by all the branches and leaves. And Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The light of the gospel, it's, the, it's this bright light that will shine through the darkest place. The light of the good news, that's the, the story that Bo liked up here a couple of minutes ago, the good news about Jesus, we read in Isaiah, rise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines upon you. But that same passage acknowledges that we're wrapped up in darkness. We're wrapped up in a moral darkness. Thick darkness is over the, peel, over the people's the darkness of hopelessness. I mean, you've probably had a morning in the last month where you didn't feel like jumping out of bed first thing when you woke up. That there, we don't always wake up full of hope, but God's good news is light. And God's good news is Jesus Christ. What does Paul say? The light of the, the, light of the gospel displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. It's not about me. It's not about you. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot build the great life that we would like to. The great life that we dream about, God has put a dream in your heart, but he's the only one who can unfold it. He's the only one who can clear the path for you for this dream of the life that he's put, put in your heart. And how does it come? We see in Scripture again and again and again, we see the cross of Jesus Christ and the grave of Jesus Christ. That is the power of the good news. That is 
the power that makes everything else possible. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. When Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2, he preaches this incredible sermon, and he says that you put him to death, Jesus, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Paul says in Romans 4, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Everything comes back to Jesus. There's, there's nothing, no problem you're up against that doesn't go back to this incredible, unstoppable power. Unfortunately, sometimes it's difficult to connect that, the idea of that power with the test that I'm going to take at school tomorrow. I wonder, what does Jesus have to do with that? Or you may have a bill that you're not sure how you're going to pay. And what does Jesus have to do with that? Or you may have a test at the clinic that you're nervous about or that you've had and the results aren't what you're looking for. And what does Jesus have to do with that? The Bible tells us that Jesus conquered sin and he conquered death and he conquered all the powers of darkness and he is the good shepherd and he comes and he will fight against the evil one and in, in your life and in my life and he will guide you through difficult decisions and he will provide when the pantry's empty. I look forward to getting to be with you week after week for, for a long time and I'll, I'll get to tell you stories about how God has shown up in my life and in people I know because Jesus shows up and he solves these impossible problems that are just too big for us. It is the power of the cross and the grave. It's the power by which he forgives our sin, by which he reconciles us to the Father, that he sent, can, opens a way to heaven. And God's good news is a treasure. Paul says, we have this good news, we have this treasure in jars of clay, now, this treasure could mean a couple of things. It can mean the good news. It can mean this life of Christ that is in you. That this life of Christ that is Jesus birthed in you. It's why we bring our children to baptism. It's why we come to communion that we're declaring, Jesus, come and refresh this life in me. That this good news, this life is an incredible treasure. That's an interesting bowl that gentleman is holding. Uh, somebody bought it at a yard sale in Connecticut. They spent $35 on it. To me, that seems like a lot of money to spend on a bowl. But that person knew a little bit more about bowls than I do. They took it to Sotheby's, and Sotheby's said it was very smooth to the touch. Its glaze was silky. The colors and designs are distinctive. It's from the 1400s, and it's one of seven bowls like it in the world. It's not just a bowl. So they put it up for auction, and it sold for over $700,000. <laughs> Would you like to make an investment like that? $35 to $700,000? There are two bowls like it at the National Palace Museum in Taiwan. There are two at museums in London one in the National Museum of Iran, and now there's this one. And we're not even sure how it got in this yard sale, but you know, there's a good chance that it was just passed down through generations of the same family who did not know how unique it was. They had a treasure and they didn't know it. Maybe they ate Fruit Loops out of it, I don't know. Maybe just sat in a, bowl, in a shelf and collected dust and people wondered, well, I don't want it. Do you want to take it? We came from great aunt so-and-so and no, you take it. It's, it's yours. It's... And that's how people treat the good news of Jesus. It's, it's been in the family for generations, you know. 
We're Christians. Grandma was a Christian. Yeah, my dad prayed a lot. I, I'm a, I think I'm a Christian. And Paul says, this is a treasure. This good news that Jesus died and he rose again. And he wants to be in the center of your life and my life. Every day, every night. It's this unstoppable message. And Savea and David Flood that we've talked about, they hit a pretty difficult time here. They got sick with malaria. The other couple got sick with malaria, so the other couple bailed. They, they decided to go back to kind of the mission station several miles back and live where it was a little safer and, and cleaner and healthier, and they, they had, and David and Savea, they wanted to go, but by this point she was pregnant, and they couldn't, they couldn't go. They had to stay put, and the local folks actually showed up with a, a midwife for the birth, and beautiful, healthy little baby girl was born, and they were thrilled, and a few days later, Savea died. And David Flood is left there with a two-year-old boy and a little baby girl. And he felt like God had betrayed him. So somehow he carried his kids back to the mission station. And he told them, I'm going home. God has forgotten me. I can't take care of this little girl. And so he gave this little girl to this other Swedish couple. He said, will you raise her? little Ina, and he took his two-year-old boy back to Sweden, and he got drunk for 50 years. And he told people, don't you talk to me about God. So Ina was being raised by this Swedish missionary couple, and then they were poisoned, and they died. So an American missionary couple took her in, and they moved back to the States and they went back home to Sisseton, South Dakota. And they called her Aggie, and they raised her. And Aggie grew up loving Jesus, knowing that, you know, she had been born in Africa, and she had lost her parents and not knowing too much about it. And she went off to a Christian college, and she married this guy who loved Jesus, and he became a pastor, and then... She went out to the mailbox one day when she was in her 40s, and in the mailbox, she has no idea how this magazine got there. It was a missions magazine in Swedish, from Sweden, and so she just started paging through it, and there's a picture of a white cross, and it says, Svea Flood. And she grabbed the magazine, and she got in her car, and she went over to the college where her husband had become president, and she found a guy who knew Swedish. And she said, what does this say? And he started reading it, and he says, there was a baby girl, and the mother died. And the missionaries left, but the mother had prayed with a little boy who used to sell them eggs and chickens. And he became, he, he loved Jesus. And he grew up, and he talked the village chief into starting a school. And he started a school, and the children became Christians as he told them about Jesus. And then they went home and they told their parents, and their parents became Christians. And there are 600 Christians in this village. Was Savea's life wasted? No. Did she have a brilliant strategy for how to turn this whole village into a Christian village? No. But the good news of Jesus is powerful. It is all surpassing. What does Paul say? We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. 
really doesn't matter how smart I am or you are or how, uh, what achievements we have or how charismatic or persuasive we are. Or, But you can tell somebody how that when life got really hard, that you prayed and God got you through it. You can tell somebody that. And it's more powerful than you realize because it's the good news of Jesus. That news will change people's lives, whether we're there to observe it happening or not, really doesn't matter. That's not the part that matters. So a few years later, the college sent Savea and her husband, it was their 25th wedding anniversary, so they gave a sabbat sabbatical and asked what they wanted to do. And she said, I'd like to go to Sweden and find my father. So they sent her to Sweden. And she found her older brother, who had been an alcoholic his whole life, and some half-siblings, and none of them had talked to her father in years. But they helped her find him. So she came into his apartment, just strewn with liquor bottles. And she said, Daddy, I'm the little girl you left in Africa. And he said, I didn't want to leave you, but I didn't know what to do. I couldn't take care of you. And she told him about the little boy who used to sell eggs and was a Christian and how the village had turned to Jesus and he said, God betrayed us. God turned his back on us. But she was able to stay for a few days and she talked with him. And God opened his heart again. And when she was coming back to the U.S., he went home to be with Jesus. Then she went to an international church conference in London, and there were different people speaking and giving reports, and one guy got up, and he was the national church leader for the Congo, and he talked about 100,000 Christians and hospitals and Bible schools, and so she went up to him afterwards and she said, have you ever heard of David and Savea Flood? And he said, I knew Savea Flood when I was a little boy. I used to sell her eggs. And she told me about Jesus. And she prayed with me. The message of Jesus changes lives and it fills up empty spaces and it puts hope where there isn't any. And Jesus heals sick bodies. And hurt minds and broken relationships. It's this same Jesus that we're talking about this morning. And Savea had the privilege to go to the Congo and visit her mother's grave and kneel there. And what does Paul say? We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us with Jesus and present us with you, to himself. It's not just about something that happened thousands of years ago. It's not just about other people. But Jesus was raised from the dead, and he will raise you. He will raise all who are trusting in Christ. Everybody's going to be raised. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in this life, we need to bow our knee and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord.
That's his invitation to us this morning, to bow our knee, to own Jesus as Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're with us this morning. And Lord, some of us have had a pretty rough week. And some of us aren't sure how we're going to get through something in this week ahead of us. But you do. And we lean on you this morning. We throw all of our burdens on you. And Jesus, we ask you to come in and to cleanse us. Wipe us clean. Thank you for cleaning our slate. We trust in you. Amen.